Hey, Adam, how you doing? It's Mike and Jay from the Detroit Cast. Hey, Adam. Hey, how you doing? We're doing good, man. Thanks for uh, calling in. We we certainly appreciate it, and we've uh, we've really enjoyed your your movie documentary, The Twenty Four Hour War, available at chassis dot com. Okay. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, man. We're not really big car guys, to be honest with you, even though we're in Detroit, um, mainly because we just can't afford them. <laughs> uh, but but it was a really cool movie, dude. Yeah, well, you know, I made it so that uh, non car guys and non car gals could enjoy it as well. That was, that was part of my plan was to see. You know, I I don't think it's right <clears throat> to make a, a documentary that just you know this group or that group can enjoy because that's like you ever get. <sighs> Well, uh, like watching home movies or something when it's not your family, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's right. not very <laughs> enjoyable, you know? And so my thing is, is if you're going to make a home movie, you got to make one where all the families can come in and enjoy it. Not just the Weinstein family, because that's unfair to the rest of the families and they're not going to enjoy it. And they're not going to spread the word and so on and so forth. So yeah. when I make the documentaries, I try to make them, so that the gearhead dude can watch with his wife and she can enjoy it as well. That's interesting you picked that up. My, my girlfriend and I were watching, I, I wanted to watch that 30 for 30 documentary on the bad boys, and she couldn't give a shit less about the, the Pistons bad boys, but watch it. She found it totally fascinating because of the, the same kind of thing you're talking about. Well, I think uh, she might enjoy uh, winning the racing life of Paul Newman as well, which is the doc I did the year before the 24 hour war, which, uh, the lady seemed to enjoy quite a bit cause it's, it's Paul Newman. And it's about salad like, dressing, right? It, yeah. Salad dressing. Yeah. It's another really, uh, good documentary. And you know, the, the, I feel sort of stupid, uh, like sitting around blowing smoke up my own ass with the, Oh, it's really good. It's really good. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll just say this to everybody. Um, if you go to Rotten Tomatoes and you take a look at uh, the 24-hour war, it'll be 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and uh, 95% uh, with the people. So it's 100% with the critics and 95 with the people. Nice. And if you look up the winning the racing life of Paul Newman, It'll be 94% with the people, <laughs> 90 with the critics, and 100% with the top critics. So wow, how bad could it be, as I, as I like to say, like, how bad can it be? <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, you know, it's the 24-hour war about the race in Le Mans. Um, for non-race fans, can you put in perspective the importance of Le Mans in the race world, and especially during the 50s and 60s? Well, it was the biggest race in the world. And I, I say the world because, like, you know, Indianapolis 500 is a big race in the United States. But this is the biggest race in the world. And I've never really even thought about this. But something like Indy was fine. But the cars that were built in Indy weren't Ford and Chevrolet and Ferrari and who Maserati or whoever. They were Lola chassis with a Cosworth engine and you know a bunch of stuff that consumers couldn't buy. The thing about Le Mans, Le Mans was huge, especially when reliability was huge in, with cars in the 60s and 70s when that was a big selling point because you had to complete 24 hours of this race without breaking down. Yeah. And so if you were Ford or Ferrari or Porsche or whatever – you wanted to win Le Mans because that meant a lot to your company. I mean, I, I guess it would be the equivalent, but maybe even a little bigger of if you were some little independent film that nobody really thought about, like Moonlight or something, and then you won the Oscar for best for best film. Well, then yeah. obviously you're going to get a lot more, you're going to do a lot more business mm -hmm. now that you have, and say you won the Oscar and it was that but times millions and millions of dollars for manufacturers yeah it, it's the it's the craziest race to watch from the start where, where the drivers are lined up across the street from their car and then have to dart to their car don't even buckle themselves in half yeah the time. and and are hitting 
outrageous speeds, 200 miles an hour, not even seat belted in, and just how dangerous it was. I, I, I love that part of the film talking about just how incredibly dangerous and, and that especially the, I believe it was 1955 with, with the worst race crash ever, I think. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's probably like the worst uh, I, 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 a spectacle, you know, disaster at any event uh, I can think of. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's been any Super Bowls or soccer games. I mean, there may have been possibly an know, air show, a soccer stadium in Ecuador where the where the stands <laughs> collapsed. <laughs> right. Yeah, something. yeah, yeah. But this thing took out eighty something people. Uh, I mean, they don't even know between eighty and ninety people. <laughs> this crash took out the uh, Mercedes. Got uh, was made of magnesium, turned into a ball of fire went to the crowd and took out 80 or 90 people. Yeah, it, it exploded like a suicide vest, and, and it just sent shrapnel into the crowd, which killed, like you said, upwards of 90 people. Well, the thing is, is they would make those cars and a lot of the parts out of magnesium because it was the lightest material they could find. But magnesium burns, and when it, when it catches on fire, it goes full napalm. It goes like molten. And so the car immediately burst into flames because they didn't, one of the reasons they weren't so high on wearing seatbelts back then yeah. is because they didn't, they didn't have, uh, fuel tanks that w- were made out of the ballistic material. See oh, the race cars I have have and in any thing close to modern has a fuel cell in it, not a fuel tank. And the fuel cell has like foam in it and a rubber bladder. And it can't, it's not just a tin can because those guys race with tin cans. And once the tin can got hit or punctured, it just blew up everywhere. And so you'd have 50 gallons of fuel just go flying everywhere and huge fires. And the drivers didn't want to burn to death. They would rather be thrown out of the car than than burn to death. That was their, I mean, I guess nobody wants to burn to death. Yeah, so that, everybody's no. take was, I don't want to be strapped into this thing, sitting on top of this fuel tank when it, when, when it starts flying everywhere. Some of the other things that I found fascinating in this, like Enzo Ferrari would would tell his son like like his kid would be hanging around the track and stuff and he'd be like yeah don't even don't even make friends with the drivers because odds are they'll probably be dead soon anyways yeah he had um one year in the 60s he had like his f1 team and he had you know he started the year with i think it was seven drivers and one of them was uh, a legend from america f1 driver named Phil Hill, uh, mm. Phil Hill, it, it was too dangerous for him. And, and he, he quit. So one of the guys quit and, uh, the rest of the six died in the one season. So he lost everybody <sighs> in one season wow. of racing. So that's, uh, that's where, that's where it was. I mean, that's sort of, that was the deal back then. Yeah. And, and people knew it entering and, Ferrari was, they tried to bring him up on manslaughter charges in Italy for yeah. killing a bunch of people in the Targa Floria race where it killed a bunch of spectators. Um, so that, that was the business they were in back then. And that was just became, I don't know, it was like complaining about death during wartime or something. Right, right. Well, right. That's what we're doing. You know, we have a very different perspective on it. Yeah, yeah. Now we have safe spaces. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snowflakes everywhere. Hey, Adam, your, your film uh, centers on the rivalry between Ford and Ferrari that developed mainly during the 1960s. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how that got going and uh, who, in your view, came on, out on top of that, if either one? Well, I mean, Ford was snubbed by Ferrari. Ford wanted to buy Ferrari. Ford, Ford wanted to get into racing quickly, and they were just going to buy Ferrari and do that, jump to the head of the line instead of do all that research and development and all the testing and all the years it takes to really develop a competitive program. 
Yeah, I guess, it, you know, as I think about it, accomplish what Ford set out to do, which is Ferrari snubbed Ford. Ford said, I'll see you at Le Mans. And Ford came back and beat Ferrari at Le Mans. Uh, yeah, I think four years in a row. And so it was Ferrari the loser. Well, you know, Ferrari's Ferrari. It'd sort of be like if you, if you talked about the rivalry between the New England Patriots and the New York Giants, they met in the Super Bowl twice, and the Giants have beat them twice. But you, you wouldn't feel sorry for the Patriots, <laughs> would you? Right, right. Good point. That's really the analogy here. Like, Ferrari's the New England Patriots, and yeah, they, they lost some Super Bowls, and they lost to Eli Manning two times and all that, but they're still Ferrari. Yeah, and Ford got the GT out of it, which, you know, incredibly, everybody's still down at the auto show just last week, oogling over that thing. I mean, that thing's amazing. Um, you don't happen to have one of those, do you, Adam? No, I don't. Uh, I don't have a Ferrari or Ford. <laughs> I actually have a Ford uh, 350 Dually that I used to t- tow around a pickup truck. Used to around the, the, <laughs> but nothing like a car. No GT40s. <laughs> $20,000. Yeah. Used. yeah. Um, no, although I did. Try to. I, I got to get my name in on the waiting list if you want to order one or something like that. Yeah, and you put a deposit down, and they vet you, and they see. You know, I, because I made this move, they have a little bit of an in. Yeah, but yeah. We'll see. They just put the specs out on that thing like yesterday, I think, or two days ago. Ford did about the new GT, and I think they're making a thousand of them. And uh, like you said, there's a waiting list. They're already sold out, according to the article I read. But they're, they've got a top speed of like 216. Nice. Yeah, perfect for L.A. Well, yeah, per, yeah right, right. <laughs> well, I think, I think people around here, a lot of our listeners are going to like this movie because there are a lot of Ford tie-ins, a lot of characters that we know and, and we've heard from before. But, um, you know, like the Carroll Shelbys and so forth. How, how important was like Carroll Shelby and his team at Shelby American to Ford's success at Le Mans. Did they, does Ford accomplish that without those guys? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, you know, he tried to do it without him. I'm walking my dog and my dog's trying to say hi to another dog. Oh yeah. He's too, he's too friendly. Now he's met another dog. <laughs> and he's, my dog's 110 pounds and obnoxious. Is the, is the point. I can't. All right. Well, what kind of right. dog is it? What kind of dog do you have? I got a black lab that's literally 110 pounds, and when he when, when he puts his paws on the ground and pulls, he will pull your arm out of socket. All right, yeah. so, be nice, big people. <laughs> um, Settle down, poops. I got shots no mirror. All right, Phil. Come here. <laughs> Phil? He's, Phil? He's a great looking dog. <laughs> he's, a sw- he's a gorgeous dog. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. All right. Settle well, down, Phil. Uh, We're losing you, Adam. Phone on the shoulder. Yeah, phone on the shoulder. Sorry. That's all right. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. You got me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah you're all right. Um, Ford tried it with uh, out Shelby, and, and, and they needed Shelby. To Shelby, Shelby won as a driver at Lamar, and Shelby he drove for Aston Martin, and he won as a driver, and then he won as a team owner when he put together the Shelby Daytona. And so here's a guy who drove and won. Here's a guy with a team owner and won. Now they won the GT competition. So they didn't win the overall race. They, they, they ran the GT in the Ford, uh, in the Shelby Cobra Daytona and won. And that wasn't the prototype division, but he, he had a guy who drove and won and had a guy who owned a team and won. And so that, that was the guy. Shelby was the guy to make this work. Well, it's, it's a fascinating documentary movie, The 24-Hour War. It's available at Chassis.com. And I know we've got limited time with you, Adam, but I, I, I would love to talk podcasting for a second if, if you've got a minute. All right. Well, just uh, literally a minute because I'm supposed to call somebody else. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, no, I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, what made you decide to get into podcasting? You've got one of the most successful podcasts in the world. You had a, you know, obviously your career was doing a million things and podcasting was in its infancy when you started. 
Like, wh- what was it that you saw in that? It was like, okay, this is the way to go. I didn't have anything to do. I'd, <laughs> I'd done Bill Simmons' podcast a couple of times. So I, I know, I knew what a podcast was because I used to go on Bill's, who was just starting out about a year or so earlier. I had a radio contract with about nine months left on it, as I uh, recall. Let's see. Yeah. And so I had about nine months paid on a radio contract. So there wasn't really any radio work to do uh, until these nine months were over. And I just sort of realized, well, look, here's a window. Why not keep in touch with my audience? My main thing was just I wanted to keep in touch with the audience. I, I hadn't been on, I hadn't been off the air in 15 years, basically. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to lose tr- touch with my audience. So I just told everyone, I'm going to do a podcast. And if you're listening and you want to keep in touch, that's how we can keep in touch. And, and I'm sure most people just said, what's a podcast? Oh, they want to know what a pod cart was. They yeah, what's yeah. The name of the cat? They know what it was. No, yeah. no. For the first number of years I did it, no one knew what, knew what it was. And now you find yourself... My, my in the- immediate family still doesn't know what it is. <laughs> Well, I don't either. You've turned it into an empire, man. And I know, I know we've gone over with our time. I, we could talk all day, Adam, and, and we'll, we should do it again. But uh, it, it's the 24-hour war. Chassis.com is where you can, you can check it out and buy it. Yeah, and people will definitely love it. And um, I guess we don't have time to it's plug it. two S's. It's C-H-A-S-S-Y.com. That's uh, right. It's spelled different. And we'll look forward to your Spike TV show also that's coming up in uh, February 28th. Yeah, watch that. I think the people will enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for listening, and be sure to visit DetroitCast.com for all new episodes of the Detroit Cast with Mike and Jay. Detroit.